So what, first off, what are the sandhills? The sandhills are unique communities of plants and animals that are found only on outcrops of sand soil in central Santa Cruz County. So um, they have been likened to, uh, biologically speaking, the Galapagos Islands, and the comparison is very apt. Uh, the Galapagos Islands, as many of you probably know, are known for, um, well, their island uh, biogeography, of course, they're actual islands, and then their high rates of endemism, meaning species of um, animals most notably, but also plants that are found in the Galapagos Islands and nowhere else in the world. So why would the Santa Cruz Sandhills be like into the Galapagos Islands by, not me, but renowned uh, botanist Peter Raven? Uh, and the reason is they also occur as biological islands. Uh, the sandhills are mapped here in yellow in the sea of, um, in central Santa Cruz County and a sea of mixed evergreen and coast redwood forests, maybe some of the other ecosystems that you've already learned about. Um, and the islands um, are disjunct in many cases, some of them perhaps for um, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of years. Uh, and as a result of their unique conditions, the, um, these Sandhills Islands support um, high rates of, or have species that are found nowhere else in the world as well, these endemic species. So in this presentation, I'll give an overview of the distribution of the Sandhills, talk a little bit about the geology and soils, then we'll um, dive into the communities, the natural communities, the flora and fauna that make them so unique, and then spend a fair amount of time talking about conservation. I really want to emphasize it's people like you doing all this important work with our local community. Uh, many of you I know work on the ground as well and do restoration and management and help patrol and all that work is, is so important to, to, um, to the Sandhills conservation. So I want to make sure we save time for that part of this as well. So first off, where are the sandhills? What is the distribution? So the sand, as I mentioned, the sandhills are found only in central Santa Cruz County. Uh, and you may have heard of sandhills uh, probably in your travels elsewhere in the United States, maybe Georgia, maybe Nebraska. And um, those places are all um, have sandhills communities too. So when I say that these ones are found only in Santa Cruz County, we're talking about the Santa Cruz or also known as the anti sandhills. Um, those communities also occur on sandy soil that's been oftentimes uplifted from marine or um, deposited soil, very similar geologically to the sand hills. And a lot of times they have a lot of um, fascinating um, endemic species and ecological similarities. But when we talk about the sand hills being endemic to Santa Cruz County, it's because these soils, these communities, these species um, oftentimes occur only in Santa Cruz County. So that's um, where does the sand come from? Uh, the sand is derived from the uh, Miocene formation known as the Santa Margarita formation. It is a sandstone and it was laid down, uh, the sediments that comprise the sandstone were laid down millions of years ago when uh, the area was underneath a vast sea. So this used to be uh, where we are now or where you are if you're in the Sandhills, uh, used to all drain out from the Central Valley uh, through um, a gap in the mountains and then used to be part of the the ocean floor and we know that because in the sand hills you can find um, marine fossils so uh, things like uh, sand dollars shark's teeth um, all sorts of uh, marine fossils including the sand hill sea cow this is one if you had a chance to go to the um the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History on, uh, on East Cliff there, the one with the big whale out in front, you can actually see this cast hanging in the, uh, the visitor center, in the, yeah, in the museum, in the bookstore part of the museum above in the ceiling there. And it's a cast of the Sandhill Sea Cow that was found in the 1960s uh, when they were doing sand quarrying. Um, and the, the Sandhill Sea Cow is of course a, a, um, an ex, uh, extinct um, relative of the manatee uh, from, um, uh, so that, that's a really great thing to go see if you haven't seen it already. Um, so the sand hills are again derived from the sandstone formation that was laid down millions of years ago, and so the soil is very sandy, and um, we call it. It's known as the Zianti sand soil. That's the official soil name. And when I say sandy, it's like, oh yeah, not just sandy. It is pretty much sand. It's anywhere from 92 to 96 percent sand particles, just a tiny bit of silt and very, very little clay. 
And so, um, as you can see here, um, if you're a gardener or know much about soil, you can just tell by looking at it, it's very poorly developed, meaning it has very low organic matter. And as a result of that, it's very low in nutrients and also has very low water holding capacity because of the lack of organic matter and the, and the coarse texture. And when you compare it to the felt and loam soil, which is, I grabbed that in my hand from underneath the redwood tree, right? So this is the difference in the soil conditions in the sand hills. At, say Henry Cowell, we're growing very close proximity to the coast redwood forest. And those soil conditions obviously um, have really important implications for the plant communities. So while our, our moist maritime climate that we have in the Santa Cruz mountains, uh, normally in a good year, I know we're in a, uh, another one of our uh, infamous drought periods, but in a typical year, you get about 40 to 60 inches of rain in the sand hills, depending on if you're in Felton or way up in Boulder Creek. Uh, and that rainfall um, can support on a loam soil, mesic forests, including coast redwood and mixed evergreen um, as pictured here. And as you know very well from Henry Cowell, but on the adjacent outcrops of Zianti sand soil, you get these strikingly different endemic plant communities. So these plants and animals are adapted to the unique soil conditions, those droughty low nutrient conditions. Uh, the Sandhills communities, we'll talk about those now, they're known locally, um, kind of in, in colloquially as Sand Parkland and Sand Chaparral. There's probably a lot of names that people kick around, but those are the two most commonly heard. And they're both pictured here in this image. The Sand um, Parkland is this community that's off in the distance on this ridge. It's um, characterized by a very open stature of very sparse trees and a very diverse herbaceous understory and very few shrubs. And then the sand chaparral is here in the foreground. And I'll show you some pictures of that as well. Sand chaparral is what's primarily found at Henry Cowell. And that is dominated by um, shrubs, including silverleaf manzanita, which we'll talk about, and has scattered ponderosa pine, also knobcone pine, and all sorts of other fun species like chinkapin growing in it. And then in the gaps between the shrubs and trees, you get these really nice herbaceous plant assemblages like shown here, uh, where species like uh, the, the Ben Lomond spine flower and um, Navaricias or Navaretias can grow. Um, so otherwise it's really dominated by shrubs. And then the sand parkland is pretty much the opposite. It has very few shrubs and instead a scattered um, overstory, like maybe 20, 40% cover of ponderosa pine trees. And then a really nice uh, diverse understory of herbaceous plants, again, including Ben Lomond spine flower and many other species. So let's talk about that diverse sandhills flora. So the flora, of course, is the plants in a given location. And the sandhills flora is very uh, diverse. And it includes four endemic species, four species that are found only in the sandhills. And these are just the ones that have been described by scientists. As I'll talk about, there's um, other species that have yet to be described. So one of the endemic species, though, is probably very familiar to you, is silverleaf manzanita. Uh, this species is a large shrub in the Ericaceae and heath family, and it's um, named manzanita, of course, for the fruits, which are like little apples in Spanish, and silverleaf or bonnie dune. Some people call it bonnie dune manzanita, um, but silverleaf I like because it's very characteristic of the leaves. Um, which are, have a very uh, silvery um, coloration, which is an adaptation to living in the sandhills. So that um, the dense hairs and the glaucous color, they actually reflect excess sunlight and help the shrubs adapt to desiccation stress or water loss due to the excess, um, the droughty soil and the, and the hot summer temperatures. They have wonderful urn-shaped flowers. Uh, they flower in December and January. And they're a very important resource for the Anna's hummingbirds that that over winter here in um, our region, these they they um, aggressively defend their territories of silverleaf manzanita. So if you haven't been out there in December and January, make sure you check out the silverleaf manzanita when they're in flower. Okay, Ben Loman spine flower is an annual plant. It's in the buckwheat family, and it's a small herbaceous plant. 
and it is named for the spiny involucres, which are just parts of the flower on the outside that help the um, fruits disperse by getting attached to the fur of um, uh, maybe rabbits and deer and other species that get stuck on my socks. I disperse them around quite a bit. Um, so that's Ben Loman spine flower. We also have Ben Loman buckwheat, and this is a perennial species also in the buckwheat family. This one is interesting in that it flowers in the summer. So if you want to go out in the sandhills in uh, July, August, September, you can find this um, endemic plant in the sandhills. It's got these wonderful little white flowers that are um, pollinated by um, all sorts, or visited and probably pollinated by all sorts of ants. And then we have the Santa Cruz or Ben Loman, depending on who you talk to, wallflower. And hopefully you're picking up on some of these names. These names um, are all for the towns that the sand hills occur in and around. So Santa Cruz wallflower is a biennial species, meaning it takes about two or three years to flower. It's monocarpic, so it only flowers once and then dies. Um, and it has these wonderful um, yellow uh, mustard flowers. And wallflower, of course, is for the tall stature um, that they can take as long as they don't get browsed by deer. This is a typical wallflower, what they would look like. And here's what happens when they get browsed by deer. They can form a lot of different inflorescences. And Santa Cruz wallflowers are a uh, favorite um, of the chalcedone checkerspot butterfly, which is a butterfly you will also see probably pretty commonly at Henry Cow out in the chaparral in the spring, likes to visit other species like Yerba Santa. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, another species that's in the sand hills that's not um, endemic and currently not recognized by the Jepson Manual, but is Santa Cruz monkey flower. This is now I should change that. It should be Diplocus Fritanii, subspecies Decretatus. Uh, monkey flower, of course, because it's got the little monkey like uh, face in the flower. And these guys, Decretatus means very short. Uh, these, these are your true belly plant of the sand hill. They get to be about two to three centimeters tall. So these are in those chaparral gaps and you'll find it growing um, along the outer loop in the expansion area that uh, Dylan mentioned. And then another species that's found in the sand hills but isn't endemic to the sand hills is Santa Cruz cypress. Uh, this is um, also found only in five locations in the entire world, uh, of one of which is in the sand hills up in Bonnie Dune. If you have a chance to check out the ecological reserve, I would re definitely recommend that. So in addition to the endemic species, the sandhills have what we call disjunct populations of coastal species. So these are species that are primarily found immediately along the coast, what we call the coastal strand, like coastal scrub, coastal dune scrub communities, um, even rocky areas, and then also occur in the sandhills. And that kind of makes sense. They, they think they're at the beach. It's a sandy soil. It happens to be anywhere from four to eight miles further inland than the normal occurrences for species like this California sea pink, Armeria meridima, and the um, Plum Maginesiae. This is a herbaceous plant that you primarily find right along the coast. And there, the inflorescences are maybe, oh, eight to 10, 12 inches tall. And in the sand hills, they grow to be twice that height, about two feet tall. So maybe, maybe because they aren't as affected by the wind as they are, maybe also because um, at, over time as they're um, uh, separated from the ones along the coast, they might also be evolving. Another coastal disjunct is the coast Dudleya, Dudleya palmeri. This species occurs in, along the coast as well as um, at the base of ponderosa pine trees in the sand hills. And what's more curious um, than the, sand, the coastal disjuncts is the disjunct populations of montane species. These are species that are primarily found in the mountains and sometimes pretty far inland. So um, sand hills have uh, pussy paws, Calptridium monospermum, which primarily occurs in the Sierra Nevada foothills, uh, Sierra Nevada mountains, excuse me, um, also the higher elevation areas of the coast range. But then the sand hills have populations that are highly disjunct from those other populations and occur much lower elevation too. Um, the, the sand hills are about uh, anywhere from 400. I think Henry Cal has some of the lowest um, elevation sand hills, and then Bonnie Dune is up to about 1,200, maybe 1,400 feet elevation, whereas most of the pussy paws is between 3,000 and 6,000 feet. And this is a um, beautiful plant in the, in the summer to see in flower. 
And then the ponderosa pines themselves are, of course, one of the most iconic disjunct species, montane uh, disjunct species in the sand hills. Um, you know, most people are really shocked when they see the ponderosa pines growing in the sand hills, and that's appropriate since they're typically found um, in the Sierra Nevada, uh, northern coast range, somewhere between 3,000, 6,000 feet elevation. Or we do have these maritime coast range ponderosa pine forests in the Mount Hamilton area and the Santa Lucia Mountains, but even those are uh, minimum 3,000 feet elevation. And so these are much lower elevation and much closer to the coast. Right now, the, the taxonomy on this one keeps changing. I've heard people say it's actually Pen Pinus benthamiana, which would be giving it a, a whole new species name um, after a, a botanist who did a lot of early work in this region, um, Bentham. Uh, but that, that keeps changing, so we'll keep tracking it. Okay, in the sand hills, you probably have noticed this, they grow, the pines grow next to a lot of the coast live oak, which is a great uh, resource for acorns. And then the acorn woodpeckers love to harvest those acorns and then store them in the soft wood of the ponderosa pine trees. So it's always fun to check out these granary trees. Uh, as I mentioned, the, some of the unique species are just sort of the tip of the iceberg, and there's other um, species that have yet to be described or could be evolving at least. Um, one of them is California poppy, uh, Schultia californica. This species um, ha has a lot of unique species that have, are varieties that have yet to be described, but in the sand hills, you probably have noticed they, they are very, um, instead of having uh, bigger or oranger flowers, the flowers are very small. They tend to not have any orange at all. Uh, although some do, and then they also have this really beautiful blue and purple um, leaf coloration. So the foliage is very colorful as opposed to orange flowers. Um, we have tipless tidy tips in the sand hills. <laughs> this is tidy tips, if you know it, it's a grassland plant up and down the coast, and tidy tips typically have. Um, oops, I don't have a picture of it, sorry. They typically have um, white tips on the outer. Um, parts of these flowers. So that's why they're called tidy tips. But in the sand hills, the flower is and uh, inflorescence is entirely yellow and doesn't have the tips. We have a pseudonophalium in the sand hills that's yet to be described. So that scientists, um, and I always marvel that, you know, scientists, um, there's just not as many people doing some of the taxonomic work that's required to describe species, but that one just hasn't been described. There's slender flower gilia. Um, this one doesn't key out according to um, most botanist description uh, to what it's described as in the, you know, the closest thing is gilia tenua flora, but it doesn't actually match that. So those are just some of the, there's actually other potential sand hills endemics. Okay, so we'll move on now to talking about the fauna. Um, that's the animal species that you'll find in the sand hills. And there's, um, at least three rare ones I'll talk about and some other unique species. Maybe you've heard by now about the Mount Hermon June beetle. Um, this um, species named again for another local community in our area, Mount Hermon, right across from the northern part of Henry Cowell. Um, and it's the June beetle, of course, because they're, they're um, the, these, uh, these adult males, um, which is what you're seeing here. They fly around in June, um, June, July, August even, and to search for mates. The rest of the time they're fossorial, they live underground um, and they, you know, it's eggs and then larva and then there's pupa. Um, this is a female actually, or they're flightless, the females. So they only come above ground just to mate with the males and the males fly around and smell the pheromones at night, promptly between about 8.45 and about 10 o'clock at night is the only time you will find these guys in the summer. So, um, that's a pretty unique life history. And they eat roots of plants as well as uh, mycorrhizae, which are the fungi that live on plant roots, right? Um, the Zianti bandwinged grasshopper is another endemic species to the sand hills. And these ones are extraordinarily rare. This, this guy is only found in five populations, um, less than 250 acres. It's only in that sand parkland habitat, which is uh, the rarest of the natural sand hills communities. Um, so these guys are very small, about an inch and a quarter long, and they're very well camouflaged. So you can, you know, they're almost hard to spot. They match the, the gray um, color of the sand pretty well. Another species for which Henry Cowell is extremely important is the Santa Cruz kangaroo rat. 
So this little guy um, was originally thought to be a Sandhills endemic, but now maybe not really Sandhills endemic, but endemic to sandy soil ecosystems in the Santa Cruz mountains. So we used to have some of that habitat over here in Coralitos where I live now. Uh, we're on the Arnold's soils. Also, of course, the Sandhills, but there's also sandy soils up on the ridge line up in um, Sierra Azul area. And um, until just a couple years ago, the Santa Cruz kangaroo rat was thought to be um, extirpated from all the other locations except for Henry Cowell and the adjacent area around Henry Cowell. But fortunately, Ken Hickman um, doing some camera trapping up in Sierra Azul up on the top of the Santa Cruz mountains in, in the Santa Clara part of the, the range actually um, detected these guys, which was super exciting. And they're doing um, some wonderful research is going to be underway to, to learn more about the population and its genetics, I believe, as well. We'll talk more about K-rats a little later on in the conservation segment. Um, and they really require these sandhill chaparral gaps that I mentioned because they're herbaceous. They feed on the herbivores, they feed on seeds, and um, that those seeds are most abundant in the, in the where the gaps are, the kind of earlier successional chaparral. Some, just like with the plants, there's other um, insects primarily that have not yet been described. So this is all, by the way, Randy Morgan was a local naturalist who did an extensive amount of collecting and work describing Sandhills communities and species. And his collections are all at UC Santa Cruz and it's uh, his knowledge of taxonomy uh, that I am relaying. I am actually an ecologist, so this is not my specialty, but uh, according to Randy, there is um, other endemic animals, including um, the robber flies and lots of ants that have yet to be described. Um, you can also find in the sand hills the coast horn lizard. So these are not endemic. These, of course, are found um, in sandy soils on the central coast, uh, including in the uh, up in Sierra Azul area on the top of the Santa Cruz Mountains. Uh, but they really require sand uh, sandy soils, and um, they're only I only see them very rarely in a one or two sand hill sites. So they're probably um, at risk of extirpation from the sandhills. And they are specialists who feed on uh, native ants. So they are native ant specialist feeders. Um, and so they rely on those ants. Um, Western whiptail lizard is another species you can find in some sandhill sites, but you're not gonna find elsewhere in Santa Cruz County at all. Um, these guys have these amazingly long tails. They're wonderful to see. Um, and the next nearest populations I believe are over at Corral Hollow over in Livermore. Um, mountain king snakes are found in the sand hills, beautiful um, animals. Um, and the Santa Cruz rain beetle, this species was also proposed for listing as endangered, but um, back in the 90s, I believe, and unfortunately it wasn't accepted as such, not enough information, but these guys are super cool. If you have a chance to go out in the sand hill, they're named rain beetle, just like June beetles named June beetle, because they come out, rain beetles come out um, in when the first rains happen each fall. So if you're ever around in October or whenever we get our first rain, head out to the sand hills and just start watching. These guys come out of the ground, they're cued by the rain, and that's what cues them to, to search for mates. Another species that used to be found in the sand hills, but no more, unfortunately, is the greater roadrunner. So this makes sense, kind of sandy soils, kind of a deserty environment, very similar to what they still do occupy in other parts of the state. Uh, they were found in the um, sand hills until about the 60s when, as we'll talk about, a lot of the development and associated impacts from that um, led to their extirpation. Um, okay, so let's talk about some of the conservation issues. So the, this is table is a little bit a lot to digest, but just trying to make the point that sandhills um, endemic species are some of the rarest of species naturally. So they have a very small geographic range, meaning just Santa Cruz County. They have a very narrow habitat specificity, meaning within Santa Cruz County, they're only found on these islands of sand soil, which by the way, I failed to mention, probably originally covered about 7,000 acres. And now we're down to about, in, depending on if you're counting every little bit of sand hills or just the high quality, between 3,000 and 4,000 acres of habitat remain. So the sand hill species are amongst your rarest of species naturally. And some like the, the, the Ben Loman wallflower and the Zanny Ben Wayne grasshopper and the kangaroo rat are extremely rare because they also have very small populations. 
So unfortunately, they're naturally rare to begin with. And then we have um, um, seen uh, habitat loss that has um, further imperiled these species. Uh, this is an old aerial image of Graham Hill Road going here. Um, this is the where the juvenile hall is right here, as you'll see shortly. So this is right where you crest the top and then drop down into Felton. Um, and you can see, obviously, this is the Henry Cowell expansion area that Dylan was talking about. And there it is. I could update my aerial. It hasn't changed much since 2002, um, but you can see we got what, what changed. We went from having this wonderful patch of Sand Hills Chaparral and Sand Parkland all here to having a very large sand mine and the juvenile hall and the whole community um, called Whispering Pines. Fortunately, we do still have the Henry Cowell expansion area. Um, when you lose sand hills habitat, you fragment uh, um, the remaining habitat. So here are some patches on either side of Mount Hermon Road in 1943, shown in yellow. And then here's what's left of the sand hills habitat if you exclude the quarries and just focus on the intact habitat. You can see that the remaining habitat is not only less, but it's also patchy and far apart, which presents issues for species like the kangaroo rat trying to recolonize some of the habitat that people are working to restore. Um, so in uh, 1994, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service listed as endangered uh, the Ben Lomond spine flower and the Ben Lomond or Santa Cruz wallflower. And then three years later, they listed the Zayani bangwing and grasshopper and the Mount Hermon June beetle. And those were both, um, especially the animal listing was super important for getting uh, protection for the sand hills. As prior to that, um, that's when um, a lot of the habitat uh, loss obviously, obviously occurred and with the endangered protection that does help um, ease some of that and kind of focus development elsewhere and, and at least provide mitigation for the development we do still need to do in the sand hills. Uh, other species are listed as state endangered. The cypress and the wallflower are state endangered. The buckwheat and the manzanita are on the California bear plant list. Um, and it mentioned the Santa Cruz monkey flower is also a watch list. And the, and the um, coast horn lizard is a species of special concern. So there's some status, but then there's just a lot of other species in the sand hills that just don't have any special status. They're statusless. Um, so it's fortunate that they get some protection from the other ones that do. Um, let's see, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that the sand hills are not only important for biodiversity, but they're really important for our local water supply. If you live in Felton, Ben Lomond, um, um, uh, sorry, Felton, Ben Lomond, Boulder Creek, Mount Hermon, probably a good chunk of your water comes directly from the sand hills via the wells that are drilled into the um, the tapping into the Santa Margarita aquifer. It's an important aquifer um, because all the sand obviously is very permeable. The water gets in there and um, they can tap into it and, and drill well. So if you're in the San Lorenzo Valley Water District or Scotts Valley Water District, of course, too, um, you get a lot of your water from the sand hills. And then the sand hills also kind of drain into our streams. And then the city of Santa Cruz gets a fair amount of its water from the San Lorenzo River, which for which the sand hills are very important uh, for contributing flow. Uh, so really important for the sand, uh, water as well. Let's see. So what's being done for the sand hills? Uh, let's see. Lots of stuff. There's some good news over the last, oh, I don't know, 20 or so years that people have been working. Well, they've been working on it longer than that. I have been fortunate enough to be working on sand hill stuff since 1993. And I would say a lot of good stuff is under underway. Um, there's, um, Dylan mentioned there's a resource, the Sand Hills Conservation Management Plan was developed in 2004. Um, a lot of people got together and uh, synthesized available research and did a conservation planning project to identify the habitat that should be protected and also recommended habitat management strategies for, which we'll talk more about, for some of the remaining um, important lands like the Henry Cowell and Henry Cowell Extension. Um, and so the plan has been being implemented, like the Land Trust of Santa Cruz County had a Save the Sand Hills campaign. It's, it's like an ongoing thing. Um, but in 2006, they launched it and they've saved um, over 600 acres of sand hills habitat, which may not sound like a lot, but it is um, a very highly parcelized area that the sand hills are in. So the parcels of habitat are very small. It takes a lot of transactions and a lot of effort to get 600 acres. And those are some really important parcels that they've protected. So. 
Um, you can see some of the, the lands here along Mount Hermon Road and they're buffering and expanding some and connecting some of the other um, protected lands. So really important um, uh, protection effort underway there. Um, and they're protecting not just sand hills, but they're protecting, you know, Bean Creek and some redwood forest and some other stuff. A lot of those properties are a mosaic, kind of like Henry Cow. So you protect sand hills and you get some grasslands and oak woodlands and redwood forests too. So it's um, a kind of a win-win. Let's see, there was a conservation bank established in the sand hills. This allows um, people who need to develop or maybe they live in the sand hills and they want to build a pool to be able to do those projects. And then still we get some benefit from the sand, sand hills get some benefit in that they um, help um, pay for protection of 23 acres, which is managed and monitored um, in perpetuity through their um, conservation credit purchase. There is a sand hills conservation, uh, sand hills habitat conservation plan that was developed that helps again with permit um, habitat projects or excuse me, development projects in the sand hills in exchange for uh, doing some conservation. So that's related to the bank largely. Uh, the city of Santa Cruz has a habitat conservation plan that protected about 17 acres up in Bonnie Dune. Um, so adjacent to the Bonnie Dune Ecological Reserve, that was a super important project. So a fair amount of habitat is being protected. Now it's not enough to just protect habitat. Uh, unfortunately, the Sandhills um, habitat that's protected is still subject to degradation due to a variety of factors that make it, um, the, that can suppress the native plants and insects and other animals. Uh, I'll just talk about three briefly, the exotic plants, fire exclusion and incompatible recreation use are kind of three of the most um, impactful, I suppose. Climate change is kind of an overlay on top of all of this, which I'm happy to talk more about. Um, but exotic plants, things like you would think that the, you know, the sand hills being such infertile soils um, would be maybe resistant to invasion by exotic plants, but things like acacias and pampas grass and French broom have been able to get into the sand hills and several sites. And so those obviously really alter the structure and species composition. Here's a, a property, a former quarry that the water district protected for its wells. Um, and it had a bunch of broom and acacia back in the early aughts. And then fortunately, um, they got the grant and um, paid for some important work to get done. And it's really transformed that area. Um, you can kind of just, I'll go back and just show you this. All this canopy that disappears was invasive acacias and um, lesser extent broom. So it kind of really opened up habitat uh, for the grasshopper and the June beetle. This is a ridge. I wish I had the before picture, but this ridge was absolutely covered with, um, we didn't even know that it was really a ridge because you couldn't really see it until after they removed all the um, acacias that were on it and really opened it up. And you get all sorts of species like silver bush lupin um, coming in. Another issue is fire suppression, fire management in general, now that we're um, experiencing obviously this drought situation and we have not, you know, we don't know a ton about the sand hills fire ecology. We know enough to know that the many of the species are adapted to fire. We don't know how frequent or how intense or everything about the fire regime, but they um, there's just a lot of indication that many species require open sandy areas that are likely maintained by fire. So again, here's some dated aerial imagery. The top is Bonnie Dune and Henry, uh, sorry, in 1940 and Henry Cowell extent expansion um, parcel in 1940. And then um, here it was in 1997, um, both of those, this one hasn't changed that much, um, of course. And you can see that the amount of open soundy habitat, the white in those images has gone way down. And that's as the shrub canopies expand um, and grow dense, we lose the open habitat that's Here's kind of what it looks like on the ground. This was the Bonnie Dune Ecological Reserve before the Martin fire and then before the CZU fire. So it was just a wall of silverleaf manzanita, um, but we need these gaps in the chaparral to have the early successional species like the Ben Lowen spine flower and the um, Santa Cruz kangaroo rat, which I mentioned. And so going into the Martin fire, um, the kangaroo rat was known in 1984 from four locations, Bonnie Dune, uh, the Olympia Whale Field in um, Felton area, 
Henry Cowell and then Gray Whale Ranch. But unfortunately, um, when it was resurveyed in 2003, it was only found, or 2001, um, it was only found at Henry Cowell. So that's where we thought it was the last known location. And as I mentioned, they've since found it up on Skyline. So that's good news. Um, but fire exclusion was implicated um, as a primary driver. There's other drivers um, for Santa Cruz kangaroo bat, people living in and amongst the sand hills with cats. People oftentimes report, oh, my cat brings those home. <laughs> um, so obviously they're not very compatible with um, things like that. But even some of these areas that are away from development, we lost the K-Rat probably because the, the habitat closed in and became no longer suitable. In 2008, the Martin fire um, burned, first burned Bonnie Dune. This is the Moon Rocks. You may be familiar with this is Martin Road. Um, so that really opened up the habitat. We were all hopeful that maybe the K-Rats were there that just at below detectable levels. But um, this is kind of what it looked like right after the fire or soon after the fire. Um, this is what it looked like, I think, the year after, two years maybe. Just absolutely wonderful wildflower blooms and great um, early successional species. And then the Santa Cruz cypress, it was super important for them. Those are closed cone um, Closed cone conifers, they're closed cone species that requires the fire to open up the cones, release the seeds, and also create the bare mineral soil conditions that the seedlings require. Also create the open canopy that they the trees require to, to grow and have enough light. Um, so kind of that's their, their cycle, right? Um, so that Martin fire was super important for reestablishing um, Santa Cruz Cypress, even though it didn't establish uh, or didn't expand habitat, unfortunately, for the Santa Cruz kangaroo rat. Um, let's see, there's a lot of smaller properties where, you know, fire is, active, uh, fire is obviously actively suppressed everywhere in around the sand hills. So if fire starts, it, it, it gets put out. So um, the, there are efforts, though, underway to both um, enhance habitat and reduce the risk of fire for people living around the sand hills. Um, this is a prescribed burn that was done at the Conservation Bank. Um, and so you can see we got some good recruitment of early successional plants there. I'll talk a little bit more about some of the work that's going on at Henry Cal too. Um, okay, let's move on to recreation. So, you know, a lot of people like to live, they live in and around the sand hills and recreation is obviously very popular in the Santa Cruz mountains. Some aspects of recreation though are not terribly compatible with the sand hills ecology. Some aspects of it are really important. Um, this is a, the Quail Hollow Quarry conservation areas. These are um, uh, 120 acre set aside uh, to mitigate this mine in the middle. So these are important areas. And you can see just these are the parcels in red I'm showing. You can see just how densely developed the area around it is. And all the folks that live in these neighborhoods love to, to walk into the Sand Hills habitat and explore. Um, back in the back of the day, I could think, think, thankfully I can say now um, there is no more um, off highway vehicle use in the sand hills. But when I first started doing research and management projects in the sand hills, uh, it was very um, there were a few sites that were uh, used pretty actively. Same thing uh, with equestrian use. Some sites obviously still are open to equestrian use, but um, it used to be uh, pretty impactful. You get the, the sand just doesn't hold up. It doesn't um, support vegetation very readily and the trails kind of get wider and wider and wider and you get these ridge tops kind of flattening out. Um, so it's, yeah, and then the other one that kind of came on in the uh, early aughts was the mountain bikes, discovered the Henry Cal expansion area. So that became a fun place to build a lot of trails and jumps. And um, that's, again, was an acute concern because the Santa Cruz kangaroo rat was living along the trails and that's where the trails were being built and used and expanded. And there was concern about collapsing burrows um, at the time. So. Um, recreation can have other impacts like um, removing the soil crust. Uh, um, I think many of you have probably heard about biological soil crust. These are communities, very complex communities of bacteria and lichen and moss and all sorts of microorganisms that kind of create a crust on the soil surface. It's the gray stuff shown here. And when the crust is intact, you got um, really these nice um, native plant assemblages. Um, so they stabilize soils, they cycle nutrients, and they also prevent exotic plant invasion. Whenever we see the crust get broken up, that's um, where we usually end up seeing a lot of the uh, herbaceous uh, weeds kind of come in. 
Um, and then a lot of times the recreation unfortunately just occurs where the rare plants and animals do. I mentioned the K-Rat and Henry Cowell. And then a lot of times the sand hills have these wonderful ridge tops that support the Zionian bandwagon grasshopper, but that's also where people like to go and um, party and things like that. And then the sand hills are also really susceptible to erosion impacts because some of them, not, not so much Henry Cowell, although some places probably, um, but some of the sand hills are very, very steep. Like these pictures are not exaggerating the steepness. It's over 50%, um, 60% or more a slope. Um, but the good news is when you remove the recreation, which is what happened at the Quail Hollow Quarry areas, you can see the, the disturbed areas get rapidly recolonized by the native plants. They come back in on their own. You don't even have to see them or anything. They're adapted to disturbance. So, um, and it, we're actually kind of learning that some of this uh, disturbance is actually a good thing for keeping um, open habitat. If, if we don't have some, some amount of use, we, we can lose some of that open habitat. Okay, so what are some other things that are going on besides habitat management? We got education and outreach work, tons of people doing stuff. We got a website, we got the Henry Cowell Visitor Center, you know, um, that was super awesome. We got, well, two visitor centers. We got the actual visitor center in the park and then the, the mobile visitor center and the campground um, have done a huge amount to increase awareness about the sand hills. Um, there's a natural, the Natural History Museum does a program for school kids. Um, boy, I could go on and on. There's lots of, lots going on. What work you guys are doing, I'm sure your, your hikes and walks and wildflower walks and stuff are all um, really doing a lot to get the word out, um, including through this website that I monitor. We get pinged all the time about people trying to do stuff for the sand hill. So that's great. Um, yeah, like I said, we have these wildflower walks. I'm sure you guys host them as well. That helps a lot. Um, let's see. So tell you a little bit about Henry Cowell a little bit more. And then uh, so the, this, this, this map I'm showing here is the, from the conservation planning project where we prioritize sand hills habitat based on a variety of factors that can influence its conservation value long term, like its size, its integrity, which was kind of like how much is it impacted by roads and activities that degrade habitat. Um, and also um, its diversity. So we collected a bunch of information about which species are in which of these patches. And so the, the darker the color, the more and higher conservation value, the patch. And so here you can see we got Henry Cowell sand hills, um, the original Henry Cowell plus the extension um, in Gray Whale Ranch, if you ever go over there, part of Wilder. And this is Bonnie Dune. These are some of our biggest most important patches as well as the area around the quarry. So uh, Henry Cowell, uh, let's see, 516 acres of sand hills habitat, uh, depending on, I guess, who's mapped and um, or what you're calling sand hills. There's always a little bit of a gray area there. Um, I think I noticed you guys had slightly different mapping than I use. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, not lots of um, great habitat in the park and in the expansion, which is in the north of Eagle Creek there. Um, let's see, we ranked it as a tier one sand hills habitat. There's eight acres of sand parkland, just as you come out at Eagle Creek on the trail there. Um, it's a very small patch, but there is some sand parkland, but all the rest is really great um, sand hill chaparral. Um, most of the sand hills expansion is uh, exquisite. And I, I've heard it's like one of the last places that the, um, the Roadrunner was seen. So it's a wonderful place. It's far away from, not far away, but it's relatively intact and away from residential development, second largest patch, highest integrity, and again, one of the last uh, two known populations that the Santa Cruz can grow at. So super, super important for long-term persistence of sandhill species. Um, Let's see, this is some maps that probably look really old and dated because they are, because um, this is the observation deck. Uh, campground over here, campground over here. Um, you can see the vegetation has changed a lot thanks to all the work that the resource uh, crew has been doing out there to try to reintroduce fire into the landscape. I'm sure Portia and Tim and those folks are hopefully telling you guys much more about that and their work over the last decade or so um, to manage the site, to, re to basically undo the effects of uh, a natural succession from suppressing um, <clears throat> the fire. Um, so there's also work to do erosion, which I'll show you, probably maybe might predate some of you. This, this was like an old road through the Henry Cowell expansion. Um, 
and then it got very channelized and the water couldn't get out and it just kept down cutting and down cutting and they got a lot of trail use when the people discovered it and so state parks went in and uh, kind of recontoured that got the water off the you know kept it from channel and i i actually haven't closed off that trail so that area doesn't um, get as much use anymore so it's part of an important restoration project um, like i said they do a lot of burning they have a whole series of burns going on um, you know, to, to keep it safe, they have to crush the vegetation, either lop it and lay it down, or um, these days they're using dozers, which is um, pretty dramatic, <laughs> but then they can come in and burn it in a safe way that's safe for the community um, and get better coverage for the fire. It burns more um, and kind of burns up the litter everywhere. So this is an area that's I think, Tim Highland over there. Uh, an area with the um, the bush poppies coming in after the fire, so get a lot of fire followers coming in, and then the silverleaf manzanita went crazy in the area. I think um, just south of Eagle Creek here. Uh, let's see. So there's been the research going on on the kangaroo rats. Um, on and off, different students typically um, kind of monitoring them. As I mentioned, I, I got to get the details, but a big grant was just awarded to do more work with these guys. So hopefully they'll have a brighter future. Um, this is some data um, that a oh, uh, UCSC student collected showing where they are. So you can kind of, um, if this is the uh, juvenile hall parking lot, this is down in Eagle Creek here. So you can see all the red are the locations where they are along, mostly along trails that she set her trap lines. And the good news was, and you probably know this, but um, when they did the burn south of Eagle Creek near the campground, um, they actually got K rats that um, hadn't been observed there before, but were trapped later. So that's super encouraging that this burning is actually going to help expand their population, um, which is otherwise very vulnerable to uh, extirpation or extinction um, due to its small size. Okay, so with that, I probably told you way more than you want to hear in one night, um, but hopefully, I just encourage you to continue to all do all your work and get to know the Sand Hills. Just to recap, there are high rates of endemism, you know, again, the species we know and the species we haven't even described yet. Um, they're inordinate diversity, lots of, lots of species I uh, didn't get to talk about, rare plants. And then they're really extraordinary rarity. I always laugh at Galapagos, they're, they're very near and dear to everyone, I'm sure, no, um, but they're 1.7 million acres and the Sand Hills originally 7,000 acres and we're down to about three or four. So they ought to be one of the rarer ecosystems. So. All right, and thank you for all your work to think globally, act locally, and do what you can as part of your docent work and other activities at the park.